What is the exact step-by-step -step process the U.S. president follows to launch a nuclear triad B-2 Spirit stealth bomber? It starts with the biscuit. No, not the snack, but a card containing the gold codes that authorize a nuclear attack. Once that order reaches the cockpit, the pilot drops a thermonuclear gravity bomb. The challenge. While the U.S. military had a massive engineering requirement, they needed to fit not just one, but 16 of these nuclear bombs inside the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber. So how did they manage to pull that off? Well, inside this tiny cylinder, they've packed 150 kilotons of power. It uses a precise multipoint initiation system to channel X-rays and ignite a massive secondary fusion. We're breaking down exactly how this intricate, two-stage nuclear engineering creates a 900-meter fireball capable of collapsing buildings and shattering windows over five miles away. But here is the real question. If this is just a free-falling gravity bomb, how does it actually hit a target? The secret lies in these spin rocket motors that stabilize its fall. More details, all in the video ahead. This is the most heavily guarded nuclear procedure in human history, and we are here to simplify it just for you. The nuclear triad gives the United States three ways to end a war. Land, sea, and air. The B-2 Spirit is the air leg, the flexible arm of the triad. Unlike a missile, it can be recalled. Unlike a submarine, it can be seen, until it decides to disappear. Here is exactly what happens when the president makes the call. The process begins with the president and the football in the black satchel that follows him everywhere. But it's not as simple as saying launch the nukes. He must authenticate his identity using a plastic card known as the biscuit. He reads a challenge similar to this code, Delta Tango, Delta Tango. This message travels to the war room at the Pentagon building and confirms whether it is valid or not. The president then selects a specific major attack option from the menu of war plans. But how exactly is the order communicated? The order travels instantly to USS Trotcom in Omaha, Nebraska. They format an emergency action message EAM, just like we animated the Minuteman nuclear silos and the Trident submarine missiles a couple of days ago. But across the globe, a high-frequency radios crackle to life. A voice broadcasts a message like this one, Sky King. A string of alphanumeric characters. Sky King, Sky King, do not answer. And the message follows. X-Ray. Zulu 4 Niner. Inside a B-2 spirit loitering on alert in the sky, the two pilots hear the code. They grab their red binders and copy the characters down. If the message matches, this is it. But wait. They cannot just flip a switch yet. The B-2 operates under the two-man rule. Both pilots must agree the order is valid. They open a sealed safe to retrieve their authentication cookies, sealed plastic cards with matching codes. If the codes in the safe match the codes from the radio, the order is valid. They look at each other. They flip the master arm switch. The aircraft is now committed to war. But the target is likely 6,000 miles away, so the B-2 cannot get there on one tank. Somewhere over the Pacific or Atlantic, they meet a KC-135 tanker. They refuel in total radio silence. No lights, no talking. Just a fuel boom connecting two ghosts in the dark. Once full, the B-2 breaks away and heads toward enemy airspace. As they approach the enemy coast, the pilot gives the order to fence in. They turn off their radar transponder. The B-2 becomes a black hole in the sky. Inside the bomb bay, the rotary launcher assembly powers up. The B-6112 nuclear bombs are energized. The red pre-arm lights on the dashboard turn green. The B-2 is the only nuclear weapon system that puts a human eye on the target. The pilot flies directly over the coordinates. The bay doors snap open for less than five seconds. The bomb is ejected and the pilot immediately banks the aircraft hard, a 45 degree turn to escape the blast radius. But just how small is America's newest nuclear weapon compared to its massive missiles? Here is the answer. This is the B-61 and it was designed to fit 16 of them under the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber aircraft. It's only 12 feet long and 13 inches wide, thin enough to wrap your arms around. Now let's compare all the nuclear triads together. This is the land-based Minuteman 3 nuclear triad. This ICVM stands 60 feet tall like a six-story building. The entire B-61 wouldn't even reach the missile's ankle. Then there's the submarine-launched Trident II, the sea-based nuclear triad. It's shorter, but look at the width. 
It's nearly seven feet wide and thick enough to park a car inside its body. The difference is simple. If we zoom out and look at the size comparison, you can see the other nuclear triads are much larger. Speaking of comparison and analysis, ever use an AI app and thought, hmm, that doesn't sound quite right. That moment is your signal. You're exactly the kind of person AI projects need. With Aligner, you can earn anywhere from $40 to $150 per hour, with top contributors making up to $250,000 a year. Aligner connects domain experts with cutting-edge AI projects to help shape how models think, reason, and respond. Projects cover a wide range of fields, including math, coding, law, language, science, business, voice talent, and more. The great thing is you can work remotely with no long onboarding process, you'll be matched based on your strengths. All it takes are a few simple steps, and soon you'll be on the Aligner onboarding path. Just a quick reminder, Aligner is competitive, and not everyone gets accepted. But if you do join, it could be life-changing contributing to the AI revolution shaping the digital age. Aligner also has a 4.5 rating on Trustpilot, with thousands of users getting paid every hour. Scan the QR code or click the link in the description to connect with cutting-edge AI projects. But dropping a modern nuclear bomb isn't just about pushing a button. The B-2 Spirit doesn't just drop the new B-61, it talks to it. It guides it. It literally spins it like a football. So what actually happens inside the cockpit during a nuclear run? Let's break down the step-by-step -step process of how a B-2 executes a B-6112 strike. Phase 1 starts long before the target is in sight, the revolver setup. Unlike a fighter jet that hangs missiles on its wings, which ruins aerodynamics and stealth, the B-2 hides everything inside. The B-6112s are loaded onto a massive 20-foot-long rotating cylinder called the Rotary Launcher Assembly. Think of it like the cylinder of a giant revolver hidden in the belly of the plane. This is where it gets smart. Before the drop, the pilot uses a digital interface to dial in the bomb. They can set the explosive yield, how big the boom is, and the burst height while they are still in the air. Phase 2. The Stealth Penetration The B-2 is a penetrating bomber. It doesn't shoot from safety, it flies directly over the target. As they approach enemy airspace, the pilots fence in. This means retracting antennas, killing all emissions, and going dark. But what if the enemy is jamming GPS? That's where a system called RATS comes in, the radar-aided targeting system. The B-2 takes a quick radar snapshot of the ground, figures out exactly where it is without satellites, and feeds those coordinates to the bomb just seconds before the drop. Here comes phase three, the drop. We are now directly overhead. The pilot authorizes the release. The massive bay doors snap open. This is the most dangerous second of the entire mission because that open cavity suddenly makes the stealth bomber visible to radar. The launcher rotates the bomb to the bottom, but gravity isn't fast enough. The bomb is forcibly ejected downwards with pneumatic pressure to punch through the airflow. Bam, doors closed, stealth restored. This phase four is where the B-6112 shows off. It doesn't just fall. Immediately after ejection, spin rocket motors on the bomb's body at night. These rockets spin the weapon violently, spiraling it like a perfectly thrown football. This gyroscopic effect keeps it stable. Then the tail kit takes over. It uses an internal navigation system to steer itself. This means the B-2 doesn't need to be perfectly accurate. The pilot can drop it from miles up and the bomb will fly itself to within meters of the target. Finally, comes phase five, detonation. A radar altimeter watches the ground. If the pilot selected airburst, it detonates above the surface, flattening buildings with a massive shockwave. But if the target is a deep bunker, the bomb waits, it slams into the earth, and then it detonates, crushing the target from the inside out. That is the terrifying precision of modern nuclear warfare. Why is this one of the smallest nuclear weapons? Well, it's designed and engineered in such a way that it fits inside this gravity bomb. This compact cylinder holds the power of 150 kilotons of TNT. But how does it actually work? It starts here on the left, the primary stage. This is the trigger. See that intricate sphere at the bottom left? That's the multipoint initiation system. It's designed to detonate high explosives all around the core at the exact same microsecond. This perfectly symmetrical explosion crushes the plutonium pit in the center, starting a fission reaction. 
Once that primary explodes, it doesn't just blast outwards. It funnels intense x-rays down this channel, the interstage. These x-rays strike the secondary stage on the right. They turn the plastic foam casing into plasma instantly, compressing that cylinder of fusion fuel until it ignites. This explosion creates a fireball roughly 900 meters wide. At around 2.3 miles or 3.7 kilometers, most residential buildings collapse, widespread fatalities occur, and eardrums rupture. Out at 5.5 miles, windows shatter and injuries occur, followed by intense thermal radiation. But why is the B-2 Spirit the ultimate choice for nuclear deterrence? To find the answer, let's take a look inside the airframe. At the front is the composite wingtip. This section comprises the ribs of the outer part of the wing. Both integral fuel tanks can hold approximately 167,000 pounds, which translates to about 75,000 kilograms of fuel, which is a significant amount. Just a small comparison, this aircraft's fuel reserve can fill up two tanker trucks, making it an insanely gas-guzzling machine. Moving further back, there is another section of the fuel tank. These fuel tanks were specifically designed to penetrate deep into Russian territory, about 6,900 miles, which is around 11,000 kilometers. Furthermore, it can travel double that distance deep into enemy lines while avoiding radar detection, thanks to this rotary air refueling system that extends all the way out, as shown here. This maximizes its range to 12,000 miles with the Boeing KC-135 Strato tanker and allows it to remain airborne for 44 hours. That is almost two days in the air, which is a remarkable engineering feat. All that fuel are consumed by these four General Electric F118 turbofan engines, each with 17,300 pounds of thrust. Let's take a look from the side profile. As you can see, it has its engine buried deep in the airframe with an S curve in front and behind. This is how it reduces its heat signature. Air is sucked by the fan rotor as it draws in, which undergoes powerful compression in both the low pressure and high pressure compressors. As the air enters the combustor, this is where fuel injection occurs. This process generates a continuous combustion of fuel and air, reaching temperatures of more or less than of 1000 degrees Celsius. The resultant heat causes the gas to expand, leading it to escape from the combustor with high energy, flowing through both the high and low pressure turbines. As a consequence, the turbine blades rotate. The energy liberated by this process drives both the compressor and the fan, thus producing thrust. Just a reminder, the B-2 Spirit does not use afterburner because as a stealth bomber, it has to compromise on speed to lower its heat signature. The exhaust from the engines is mixed with ambient air before it exits the airframe. This significantly lowers the temperature of the exhaust, hence reducing the heat signature suitable for this stealth bomber to remain undetected as much as possible. For a conventional aircraft, it has ailerons at each wingtip that move opposite one another to roll the plane. It also has elevators at the tail that affect pitch, and the rudder controls yaw or rotation. However, if we look at the B-2 Spirit, it doesn't have all of those control surfaces like a standard aircraft. You'll notice that there are no leading edge slats. The massive wing, which essentially comprises the entire aircraft, generates enough lift on its own. Instead, the B-2 Spirit has outboard elevons located here close to the split drag rudder, mid-elevons and inboard elevons near the engine exhaust. These control surfaces are located all over this area and move independently as a single unit. They can move opposite one another to achieve roll and work together for pitch control. They also use a combination of both for maneuvers that require some roll and pitch at the same time. As stated, almost every aircraft has a rudder and elevators to turn and stabilize the plane, but the B-2 Spirit has none of these. This is because any vertical structure would reflect radar waves, which is why they had to design it without vertical stabilizer or rudder at the rear. Instead, they use this technique of split drag rudders to provide directional stability and control in a flying wing aircraft. But there is a catch as opposed to conventional rudders, the control efficiency of split drag rudders is typically low for small deflection angles. That is why the B-2 Sprit turns very slowly compared to other military planes. Each split rudder consists of two separate panels that swing out vertically in opposite directions. When the left split rudder opens, it produces drag and causes the B-2 Spirit to yaw to the left in the direction of the open split rudder. 
The same effect occurs with the opposing right side split rudder. This is what happens inside the cockpit. When the pilot pushes the left rudder pedal, the left split rudder opens, causing the aircraft to yaw to the left. Similarly, when the pilot pushes the right rudder pedal, the right split rudder opens, causing the aircraft to yaw to the right. The B2 Spirit composite can be divided into several parts. Here, we find that all the edges are made of fiberglass epoxy to reflect radar, while the largest part of the wing is primarily made of graphite epoxy. Interestingly, the crew station assembly is made up of aluminum. At the base, since these areas have to withstand a lot of heat from the engine, they are made of titanium, a super strong expensive material. Finally, we have fiberglass polyamide, a stealthy material able to withstand heat. This is what it looks like with all the labeling and segments assigned to it to give you a better picture. Let's take a look at the $1 billion radar paint technology, which is still classified, but here's what we know from aviation experts. It involves the use of radar absorbing material, also called RAM. RAM is a polymer-based material applied to the surface of stealth military aircraft, like the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II. Moving to the belly of the beast and opening the bomb bay door is this weapon adapter suspension, which makes this bomber formidable. While the B-2 Spirit might look small, it can fit around 80 numbers of Mark 82 bombs weighing 500 pounds. Yes, all these 80 weapons can fit inside this weapon adapter, totaling around 40,000 pounds, which is approximately 18,000 kilograms of free-fall gravity weapon system. Depending on the mission, the B-2 Spirit can switch to this rotary weapon system, enabling it to carry around 16 numbers of AGM-158 missiles, which can cost around $1.5 million each. When ready, a B-2 Spirit can drop this weapon payload discreetly. The AGM missiles unfold their wings to fly towards the target, traveling up to 230 miles, which is around 370 kilometers. But why do we need the B-2 bomber when we have the B-52 Strata Fortress, animated in our recent video, and the B-1 Lancer? Let's take a look at how this works. The first line attack involves the B-2 Stealth Bomber moving in to destroy high-value air defense systems like the famous S-400 Triumph and other surface-to-air missiles, effectively disabling them by using its stealth technology. Next, the B-1 Lancer flies at a very low altitude towards enemy targets to take out older anti-aircraft guns and missiles. This clears the way for conventional aircraft like the B-52 Strata Fortress, which can then sweep in to destroy any critical infrastructure without facing anti-aircraft threats. This is the reason they need both the B-2 Stealth Bomber and conventional bombers, as there are only 19 units of the B-2 Spirit in service to date. That's a wrap on the nuclear triad. We've broken down the Minuteman silos and the Trident submarines, so you can catch all the parts right here. Don't miss our next deep dive, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos.